So we're in chapter 9 of Daniel, but let's look back at what we've looked at already because it gives us uh, an indication or helps us understand or put the puzzle pieces together that we're going to be looking at in chapter 9. In chapter 2, we remember that Daniel is going to interpret a dream that the king Nebuchadnezzar had. And the and the dream involved the world governing empires that would come about and control the known world at that time. Uh, when the Babylonian Empire had conquered over Jerusalem, that began the times of the Gentiles, right. That was the time of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles began with the conquest of Israel by the Babylonians began with that first siege in 605. Second uh, deportation was in 597. Then finally, Jerusalem was destroyed in 586 BC. That began the time of the Gentiles, and it will not end until when? The millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the second coming. And so what Daniel sees in chapter 2 is these world-governing empires that are coming about. The first one being Babylon, the second one being Medo-Persia, the third one, the fourth one, Rome. And that's as much as he says. But then, then when we go on and we move further on into the text, and if you got into chapter 7, now it's Daniel interpreting uh, or having the angel help him interpret the dream he has and he sees these beasts remember the four beasts that he saw first was like the lion representing Babylon the second was like a bear representing the third was like a leopard representing but the fourth the fourth now a little more description than what we saw in chapter 2 if you look at 7-7 seven, seven, after this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast dreadful terrible exceeding strong and had huge teeth it was devouring breaking in pieces trampling the residue with its feet it was different from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns gives us a little more description as we try to put together this puzzle I was considering the horns and there was another horn a little one coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots, and th there in this horn were eyes like eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. Now, who was that little horn? The Antichrist. So now we, we see that, that, that now it's not just Rome. There's something more than Rome. There's that revived Roman Empire in Nebuchadnezzar's vision in the plain as he prepared this this image of himself the feet were partly iron partly clay a loose confederation of nations comprising the old roman empire i think that could be considered the eu today a council on foreign relations uh, there's a number of of confederations that are taking place as we're pro approaching or marching towards the end of the age we're going to see this happen there's going to be a revival of the former roman empire but it's going to be a loose confederation not as strong as previously. But in chapter 8 now, if we went there, again, we see these uh, images representing these world governing empires that will come, all Gentile, right? But let's look at that little horn again for a minute. In verse 9 of chapter 8, out of one of them, and this would come out of the revived Roman Empire, a little horn which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. Where's that? Israel, and it grew up to the hosts of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the hosts, right? And by him, the daily, no, we're talking about daily sacrifices. We haven't been talking about sacrifices up until this point, but the daily sacrifices are taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and there seemed to be a temple as well. Now, we do know that it's prophesied that in the end of the age, the Jews will rebuild their temple. So here we get a little more of an indication, this revived Roman Empire, this leader, listen to me, what we're marching towards is global communism. If you really are aware of what is happening today in our, in our nation, in our culture, we're, we, we're embracing Marxism. Socialism at best, communism at worst. And that's what we're marching towards. If God has foretold us the future and he is sovereign, not that he purposed this to come about, but has permissively allowed this to take place, there's no stopping it. Global communism is going to dominate the globe and there'll be one man who controls all of it. It'll be a one-world economic system, a one-world religious system, a one-world governmental system, a one-world medical system, Singer payer. 
And that's what we see taking place now. The three institutions that communism hates more than any other, the first is the family. You have to destroy the family, the family unit. And, and you have to get children to rebel against the parents and the, and the parental authority that would take place, particularly among the father in the home. And we, we see that, don't we? The attack on the family. The second institution that communism always attacks is the church. That's right, the church. So it's the family and the church. And we're seeing more and more hostility grow towards Christianity. You know, as they're burning Christmas trees in the nation, isn't that a religious symbol? Shouldn't that be declared a hate crime? Are not Christmas trees a symbol of our celebration of the birth of Christ? It's not a holiday tree. It's a Christmas tree, right? And so we see, we see the attack coming on the church. Now, thirdly, third, they have to attack any democracy, any government that would be formed that would support the Judeo Old Testament Christian New Testament philosophy of life, which exalts individualism and individual freedoms and rights rather than the collective. Communism always embraces the collective, don't they? Hmm. Well, this is what we're is being described for us is how this is going to come about in the latter days, in the end times, where there'll be global communism controlled by one man. One man who is controlled and possessed by whom? Satan. Now, do we call him Antichrist because he's possessed by Satan? No. Why do we call him Antichrist? He's a false Christ. He presents to himself as the savior of the world. Not that he's against Christ, but he's a false Christ, right? So let's read the description again. Chapter 8, verse 11. And even he exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. That's Jesus himself. And by him, the daily sacrifices are taken away and the place of the sanctuary was cast down because of transgression. An army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifice and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. So we, we see fake news. It's going to be everywhere, isn't it? Hmm? <laughs> now, it indicates for us, as we move further on into chapter 9 now, he's going to give us an understanding of, of how this is coming about and, and God's program, God's plan. God views the way in which he deals with the world globally in the way in which he uses his people, Israel. Israel. God chose to represent himself through nature, right? And what do we learn about God in nature? My God is so strong. My God is so great. There's nothing my God cannot do, right? We learn about his, his, his genius. We learn about his power, right? We learn about his, his, his majesty. But what else? The, the revelation of God in creation is limited, in creation, we don't learn about his moral or ethical purity, his righteousness, his holiness, do we? No. What did he give us? What did we receive to learn about his holiness, his purity, his righteousness? The law. The law. The law really displays for us the ethical and moral purity, righteousness, holiness of our God. And we recognize that he is and we aren't, right? Right? He is divine, and you ain't. <laughs> right? Now, that's the second way in which God has revealed himself to mankind. The third way in which he's desired to reveal himself, and more specifically, his mercy, his compassion, his grace, his forgiveness, his redemption, is through the Jewish people, through Jesus specifically, through the Jews. He chose Israel to represent himself, his love, the redemption he was offering the world through Israel through the Jew. Is that not true? Yeah. And so the way in which God views all of world history is in the way in which he's dealing with the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And so here in Daniel 9, he's giving us an overview from that point of the beginning of the times of the Gentiles until the very end of the age, what's going to be taking place and, and how he's going to be specifically working through the Jewish people. You with me on that? Okay. So in Daniel chapter 9, we went through the first 19 verses already, didn't we? Yeah. Yes, we did. Gabriel was praying, 
And he asked God for some answers. Verse 17, chapter 9. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplication. For the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Now, now he, he knows that the prophecies of Jeremiah are that the people are going to be released from their captivity. They're going to go back into the land, rebuild the city, rebuild the temple. How long was this captivity to take place that Jeremiah prophesied? Why 70 years? They never gave the land its rest. Now, remember, God works in sevens, right? Six days you shall labor, the seventh day you rest. Six years you will plant your fields, work your land, the seventh year, the year of rest. Seven sevens, the jubilee, okay? So God always works in sevens. Uh, We Gentiles like to work in tens. We like tens, don't we? Yeah, yeah, but God likes sevens. But here he's indicating for us that... uh, the 70 year captivity that was taking place where God purposed to give the land its rest that Israel never gave the land. Isn't that interesting? They never did that. What what else did they never do? They never celebrated the year of why had to forgive all their debts. Anybody that owed you anything, you had to forgive them. Wouldn't that be nice? You see, there's a big push now to forgive all these young people of their college debts. Now, is that really fair? No, 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 no. (laughs) But Israel never obeyed the year of the Jubilee in forgiving everyone their debts and setting them free and giving back that which was theirs based upon the tribal territory uh, uh, designations that were made. Shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Verse 18 now, chapter 9. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city, which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because we are righteous, because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Yeah. As uh, Jeremiah would lament in Lamentations chapter 3, right? His mercies are new. Every morning, great is thy faithfulness, right? And so Daniel is doing exactly what we need to do constantly is lean upon what we know about the nature of God. And the nature of God primarily is, the way of God is love, love. And that love is described for us in Galatians chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And, And the only one who fits the description of this love is Jesus, right? So Daniel's going to lean upon God's mercy, his graciousness, his forgiveness, and and so should we. And in response, what, what should we be offering him as he offers us his grace, his forgiveness, his mercy? Our lives, our obedience. Yeah, yeah. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. But we don't like to remember the second verse. What's that? Perfect submission. (laughs) We, We want that blessed assurance, but it only comes by way of perfect submission. Was Daniel perfectly submitted to God? Oh, boy, he sure of any. You know, there was nothing ever said negatively of Joseph of Egypt or Daniel in Babylon. Amazing. And Daniel is told here in the beginning of chapter 9 that he is greatly beloved of the Lord. And as we move on, we're going to see two more times he's told, he's, you need to know, Daniel, God thinks you're awesome. He's crazy about you. Wouldn't you like to know that God's crazy about you? Well, he is. Just read the New Testament. Yeah. Nonetheless, Daniel is crying out to God for his great mercy's sake. Verse 19, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and for your people called by your name. Which is city? Jerusalem, his people, the Jews, the sons of Jacob, right? And so he knows, he knows the prophecies of Jeremiah are about to come. It's been uh, somewhere between 68 and 69 years that he's been there in Babylon, serving as an administrator in the, in the government of Babylon and then the Medo-Persian, right? As an administrator, but he recognizes that, that the time has come. The signs are there. We're approaching the end of this period of captivity. I hope that you have an ear to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that believes we're approaching the end. The evidence is overwhelming, although most have their head in the sand. Most don't even see it. 
But the evidence is overwhelming that we are approaching the time of which the Bible speaks more of than any other, and what a glorious time it will be when we see the redemption of this world and the salvation of the Jew. So he goes on to say, Now, while I was speaking, praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, presenting my supplication before the Lord my God, for the holy mountain of my God, what mountain is that? Zion. In Abraham's day, what mountain was that? In Abraham's day, what mountain was that? Moriah. Moriah, right? Yeah, Moriah, where Genesis 22 was played out. What were the Jews called Genesis 22? The Akadah. The Akadah, the binding of Isaac, where Isaac willingly allowed himself to lay down his life, right? That they emphasize it from that perspective, which is we should too, because really it's a representative of Jesus Christ. Laying, no one takes my life, he said, but I lay it down, the Akadah, right? All right. So while, verse 20, uh, verse 20, the holy mountain is Zion or Mo, uh, Moriah, verse 21, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, he wasn't a man, who's Gabriel? Archangel, archangel, Gabriel's ar an archangel created to minister on behalf of what part of the Godhead? The Holy Spirit, just like Michael, the archangel was created to minister on what part of the Godhead? The Father God, just like Lucifer was created to minister unto what person of the Godhead? Jesus, but he rebelled. Now, Gabriel, whom I had seen at the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering, uh, where it's recorded for us in Daniel 6, that chapter 6, that Daniel prayed faithfully three times a day. So this was his evening prayer, evening offering when he's praying. And he informed me, he, Gabriel, informed Daniel and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Now, God no longer calls us servants. Right, Mike? We're friends. Why? He's revealed all things unto us. Now, if you have a hard time understanding the Bible, then maybe you're not surrendered as you should be. That's a possibility, because as the more we surrender, the more we yield to the will of God, the more God gives us revelation, understanding, enlightenment in his word. Sin will keep you from this book, but this book will keep you from... Is it true? Yeah, but the, the more you go into sin, the more difficult it becomes to receive from the Lord and from his word. The more difficult it becomes for you to understand... But Daniel was such a yielded man, and God gave him such insight, such revelation, such wisdom, such light from above, right? And so we, we should pray for the same. I'm just, I'm, I'm so thankful. It's been, it's been a long time. <laughs> it's been a long time, uh, 41 years, I think it is, that I've been walking with the Lord. But I'm just so thankful that it, I, 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 isn't it wonderful, dear, when we pick up the word, and every morning he, he speaks to us. There's light. It's fresh. It's new. And, and, and listen, that's the way it should be for all of us. That's the way God desires it to be for his children. But it, becomes, it comes as a result of being rightly related to him, yielding and surrendering to him, living for his glory. Daniel, I'm going to give you skill to understand. You are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter. Now, he's going to be talking about the way in which God is dealing with the nation of Israel. From this point on, he says in verse 24, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Okay, what's a week? Seven days, right? Seven days is a week. Is that right? Well, from our understanding, it would be, but from the biblical understanding, that's not right at all, is it? Turn to me to Genesis for a minute. We see where this term weeks is used and what it, the interpretation is thereof. Hmm. Jacob, can you imagine? <laughs> Jacob, of all people. What's Jacob mean? Dirty rotten, Dirty, rotten scoundrel. Used car salesman. A slick willy. 
And so Jacob gets Jacob. Remember? Jacob swindled his father and his brother. He swindled his brother out of his birthright. He deceived his father. And then he had to go on the run. And who does he run right into? Hard Laban. <laughs> Hard labor for sure. He runs into Laban, Uncle Laban, right? And he's seeking a bride. So what happens when he ends up with Uncle Laban? Well, he, he sees the woman of his dreams, right? Who he wants to marry. What's her name? Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. And, and he, he strikes a bargain with Jacob. And he says, I'll work for you for a week. One week. And then you give me Rachel as my wife. Jacob says, okay, you work for me seven days, and I'll give you a raise. Is that what he said? No. What was the week? Ah, look at verse, chapter 29. Look at verse, uh, he, got, he got Jacob to buy Laban, right? He didn't get Rachel. Who did he get? No, why did he get Leah? Leah was hard on your eyes. What did that mean? She said, no, look, it's too good. <laughs> Italian vernacular. You know? She said, no, look, it's too good, you know? <laughs> oh, but she, that's what my grandfather told me, Afonso. He says, Rich, you don't, don't worry about the looking. You worry about the cooking. And the look, she goes. The cooking, it stays. <laughs> Call me pasta, Rit. Pasta, Rit. You know? <laughs> she signed a Christmas card today, and she signed it, pasta, Rit. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. Let's get <laughs> to the text. <laughs> She's a no looker too good. And you know, the younger daughter can't get married before the older, right? So we're going to give you Leah. Oh, boy. So look what happens. Verse 29 now, it says, Then Laban gave, uh, excuse me, where am I? 27. Verse 27 of Genesis 29. Did I tell you Genesis 29? Okay. Genesis 29, verse 25. So it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. <laughs> and he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Was it not Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week. And we will give you, that's, down, that's where we're going here. What does this week mean? How do you interpret a week? What does it mean? Seven years, seven years. Now, in case you're wondering, Jacob's heart was won over by Leah. You know, if you're a good looking person, it can be a curse. I'm so glad God made me the way he did. You know, I'm not one of these strikingly handsome rock cuts and kind of guys, you know, but those people become very shallow. They're very vain. And so was Rachel. But Leah was a different woman entirely. And Rachel died in childbirth, birthing who? Benjamin, Benjamin, son of my right arm. But Jacob when it came time to be buried, he was buried with who? Leah. Leah, Leah not Rachel. That's a whole nother story. We won't go there. But anyway, I just went there to tell you we're going to interpret this 70 weeks. 70 weeks are not 77 day periods, 70 weeks are 77 year periods. Okay? 70 weeks of years, not days. So go back to Daniel chapter 9. I don't know how far we're going to get tonight, but we'll have some fun with this over the next couple of weeks. 70 weeks. And so we measure everything in 10. So we call 10 years a, they call seven years a heptad, heptad. So to a Jew, everything was measured in sevens. And so these 70 sevens are 70 heptads is the word in the Hebrew. 70 heptads are 70 seven-year periods. He said there's 70 seven-year periods determined for your people, who are they? Israel. Israel, the Jews. And for your holy city, which one is that? It was not Rome? Rome's not the holy city? What's the matter with you Catholics? <laughs> no, it's not the holy city, it's Jerusalem. And this is the purpose, right? To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. What, 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 what's he going to do in the first phase of his coming? 
God working and dealing with Israel. What's he going to do? He's going to heal them of the, the sin problem. The sin problem. Now, now, Jesus has come and become the sacrifice for sin for all people, both the Jew and Gentile. Is that correct? Right. Now, Israel hasn't come to the place where they have appropriated that gift of forgiveness offered by their Messiah, but they will one day, won't they? One day, the feast of, it's not a feast at all. No, the most holy day for the Jew of the year is what? Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement is where they, they approach God in prayer, hoping, and, and in offering sacrifice. There's no sacrifice for them now. You know how most Jews believe they can approach God on the Day of Yom Kippur now because there are no sacrifices? Through their good works. They don't have any. Why do you call me good? Jesus said, no one is good but God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But there's coming a day, and that's yet future, where Israel will recognize Jesus Christ as their Messiah, where the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, will be fulfilled. The spring feasts were all fulfilled on the very day by Jesus at his first coming, dealing with the sin problem. Now, we have been the recipients of that blessing of that redemption, because the, the redemption that Jesus was offering, rejected by Israel, rejected by the Jew, has now come to us, the Gentiles. And we call this age what? The church age. But make no mistake, God is not done with Israel. God has not cast Israel aside. So many today are embracing replacement theology. It is, it is of the devil. Replacement theology is demonic. Now, I'm not saying that those Christians who embrace that are demonic, but they are being influenced by devils and by the doctrine of demons, okay? Because God is not through with the nation of Israel. If God would, would, would fail to fulfill his promises to Israel, then we have no reason to believe that he's going to fulfill his promises to us, right? Because they're lun, lun, unilateral, right? They're not bilateral. God doesn't say, I will if you will. No, the most important promises, the most precious promises of redemption that God offers, he says, I will, I will, I will, I will. Isn't that wonderful? And he promised he will. He will revive Israel. On the day of atonement, on Yom Kippur, the first three feasts were filled, fulfilled on the very day, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. 50 days later, that summer feast called was fulfilled on the very day. Isn't that fascinating? And then, then the next three feasts are all in the fall of the year, all have to do with the second coming. The first feast, the first phase in the second coming. Second coming's in two phases, right? First phase, he comes for the church. Second phase, he comes with the church, right? First phase is the fulfillment of the day of Russia. Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year, which coincides with the Feast of Trumpets. No man knows the day or the hour. It's a two-day feast, right? But it's going to be 2 o'clock when it happens. Why do I say that? Well, it'll be 2 o'clock somewhere, right? On the globe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, then, once the church age is over, the fullness of the Gentiles that come in, right? The church age is over. The church is raptured. Then God, the Holy Spirit, begins to work powerfully among the Jewish people, and they see Jesus whom they have pierced. And they will mourn. All of those prophecies that Zechariah gives where the spirit of grace and supplication, the spirit of salvation will come upon the Jewish people and, and they will say, where did you get these wounds? And they'll say, in the house of my, my friends, my friends. Yeah. And then, then, after a period of trouble for which the world has never seen before and no will ever see again, where global communism takes control and dominates every man, woman, and child on the globe, and there'll be a period of suffering that will make Hitler's Holocaust look like he was a Boy Scout in comparison. Horrific. But at the end of all of that, there's good news. Then, then we come with the Lord and fulfill, what feast would that be? Sukkot, tabernacles. He comes to dwell among us. Emmanuel, once again, Right? Okay, so this is the program. It's all, it all deals with how God is dealing with Israel. He came the first time to deal with the sin problem. Turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 4.
Chapter 4, let's pick it up at verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. For the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's the anointed Messiah, right? (laughs) Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, to recover the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He's dealing with the sin problem. Now, notice he actually fulfilled what Daniel wrote here in chapter 9, verse 24, to finish the transgressions, make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. He did that, right? We know about sins, iniquities, and transgressions. Sin? You missed them out. Transgressions? You willfully cross the line. Willfully. Rebels. You know? You won't obey the authority, right? (laughs) Sins, you missed the mark. Transgressions, you willfully cross the line. What are your iniquities? Your nature, your twisted, wicked heart. Ooh, we need a new heart, don't we? I mean, when we come to Jesus, what we're really asking him is to change our life. Change me from the inside out, Lord. Lord, give me a new heart. Lord, I hate who I am. And who I am is an offense to God. But that's what he dealt with at the first coming. Now, it's the second coming of Jesus when that second phase, you know, first time he comes for the church, second time he comes with the church. Look at the second half of verse 24 of chapter 9 of Daniel. He's going to bring in everlasting righteousness. Yeah, we see that on the West Coast, don't we? Everybody's shopping for free. <laughs> now, you, you can steal up to $2,000 and they won't, they won't even prosecute you. Is that insane? Oh, wait a minute. It's part of the plan. All of this criminality, all of this lawlessness, you see, they're creating the chaos, and then you're going to surrender everything to them to bring a resolution to the chaos. That's that's the way of communism. That's the Marxist playbook. Talk to Juan and Mercedes who grew up in Cuba. I'll tell you. Do, Do we live in a state now of everlasting righteousness? No, not hardly, not hardly. Oh, to to seal up vision and prophecy. All of the prophecies that God has given us with regard to what he's going to do in this world right up until the time of the end, have they been fulfilled? No, but they will be at the second coming. Righteousness will be established from shore to shore. Wouldn't that be wonderful? What's the most wonderful thing about heaven? Sinless. Sinless everywhere. You'll, You'll never, ever, ever have a worrisome thought. An anxious thought, a concerning thought, ever. If you have a concerning thought, that would be a concern. If you're in heaven, right? (laughs) Yes. Bring in everlasting righteousness, seal of vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy. What is he talking about there? Jesus said he's been anointed by the Holy Spirit already, right? We read that in Luke 4. But, but what are we talking about? Giving Jesus his rightful due, allowing him to sit on the throne of the earth. Right now, you need to allow him to sit where? On the throne of your heart. You need to get off that throne. You need to let him get on, right? I was speaking with someone today, and they were referencing some situations that they know these people are having some serious problems adjusting with certain things in life that are getting a hold of them and they say well they're 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 spirit filled i said uh excuse me you would not have these manifestations of the flesh if you're spirit filled no 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 no. the believers i said i'm not saying they're not believers i said but they're not spirit filled you cannot be spirit filled and have your life characterized by sin that's an impossibility okay Being spirit-filled means your focus is on the Lord. Your priority is the Lord. Your will is the will of the Lord. And and that's what it means to be spirit-filled, to be filled with the Spirit. Now, you can be a Christian and not be filled with the Spirit. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, you can grieve the Holy Spirit, right? That's why Paul encourages us in Ephesians to constantly be filled with the Holy Spirit. Hmm? 
I went there for a reason. Why didn't I go there? Must have been a reason for it. I'm sure you'll think of it if I don't. Now, 70 heptad, 70 seven-year periods, God is going to deal with the Jewish people. He's going to bring the Messiah. The Messiah is going to be the Passover, literally the Passover of Israel. He's going to die for the sins of Israel, the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And then he's going to come, and he's going to come as a lion of the tribe of Judah. He's going to establish his kingdom. It'll be a kingdom of righteousness where he reigns forever and ever and ever, as Billy Graham would say, right? <laughs> And all of that will take place within this 77s that he's dealing with the nation of Israel. Now, all of you are familiar with this. I'm preaching to the choir, I know. But it's a good reminder for us. Now, he says, <clears throat> verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Now, Daniel was, knows that the prophecy is that they're going to go back into the land. They're going to be reestablished in the land. They're going to rebuild the temple. They're going to be worshiping God once again. And so Gabriel's giving him the answer, instructed by God to give him the answer to his questions. And he said, from the time the command is given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Unto the coming of the prince, the prince of life, the prince of the covenant of Jesus Christ himself, the Messiah, there shall be 69 seven-year periods. He said seven weeks and 62 weeks. Why the seven weeks? What happened in the first 49 years? That was the completion of the rebuilding of the temple. They went back, and it took them 49 years. 49 years. Once Cyrus, now you remember the, the scroll of Isaiah was given to Cyrus, the king of the Medes. And, and so, oh, by the way, God's, God sent a letter for you. It's taken a little time to get here. He wrote it 150 years ago. <laughs> and here it is. Can you imagine reading your name written in an ancient prophetic scroll 150 years ago? And it says, this is what I'd like you to do. It's all here. When did he know you? Before the foundation of the world ever came to existence. But don't be surprised. We, we should be more shocked than Cyrus was. Than I am. It's written in the Lamb's book, right? But nonetheless, the, the prophet came to Cyrus and said, listen, he's speaking about you. Oh, I better let them go. And so he let the people go. When, when he allowed the people to go back and reestablish the nation of Israel, reestablish the, the city of God, Jerusalem, reestablish the temple upon the Mount of God, Mount Zion, how many went back? 49,000 plus. Less, just, less than, just under 50,000 left Babylon and went back to God, returned unto the Lord. Was that a remnant or was that the majority of them? That was a tiny remnant of Jews. Why did the most majority want to stay in Babylon? Business. Business was good. It was good in Babylon. They did well in Babylon. And there was a lot of compromise and accommodation and appeasement that they made with their flesh and their spirit. And they didn't want to leave Babylon. They didn't want to leave the world. You ever talk to somebody and talk about the return of the Lord? They say, well, yeah, yeah, I know, but not, just not now. Anybody ever say that to you? Just, just not now. I'm just not ready now, you know. Well, they really don't understand. They're too entangled with this world. Babylon has got more of a hold upon them than the kingdom. Hmm? Yeah. But nonetheless, when King Artaxerxes was the one who released the Jews to go back, do you remember what that was? Any history buffs? You know when that was? You got it written in your Bible? We believe it was 444 B.C., it's written in the book of Nehemiah, where the king allowed Nehemiah to go back under the king's decree and reestablish the name. Now, now, what is being prophesied here is to come 49 years, seven sevens, to rebuild the temple. But there will be 62 sevens on top of that before the prince comes, the Messiah. 69 seven-year periods. 69 seven-year periods is how many years? 483 years. Now, how many days would that be? Now, the Jews used a lunar calendar. Every month had how many days in it? 30. 30. How many months? 12. Do the math? 
360 day years. This is what you got to understand. You got, you know, you got, you can't be, you can't put your Gentile cap on. In order to understand the scriptures, you need to understand it from a Hebrew mindset, from a Jewish mindset. And, and you'll have no problem with the scriptures. And, and the New Testament, New Testament is in Koine Greek, but it needs to be understood with a Jewish mind. We've lost sight of that in the Gentile church today, where Israelology is not even part of their systematic theology. There's no Israelology. They're anti-Semitic, and it's growing more and more and more. And that, again, is an, an instigated by the devil, you know. But nonetheless, 360-day year. So if it's a 360-day year, it's 483 years. You do the math, it's 173,880 days. Wow. Really? Daniel was so blessed and privileged, understanding wisdom, enlightenment, revelation. He gave the very specific day in which the Messiah went into Jerusalem. The first time and the second. Did you know that? Daniel prophesies to the very day, the first and second coming of Christ. Not the rapture, but the second coming, right? But here, here, he records for us that it'll be 69, seven-year period. Verse 25, again, know therefore and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, jot down Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. There it is. Unto the coming of the prince. The coming prince is Jesus, of course. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, 69 seven-year periods. And the street shall be built again. The, the city was built. The temple was built. The wall was reestablished. Even in troubles, and it was a troublesome time, wasn't it? They had, they had to work with a trowel in one hand, right? And what? Sword. And a sword in the other. And each man helped build the wall in front of their home. So you're de really defending your home place, okay? So that, that's why they were so ferociously defending their territory, and they won against all odds, right? But nonetheless, now go to Luke chapter 19. Luke 19. Now, Daniel gave them understanding. Daniel was told by God that he wants not only Daniel to have this understanding, he wants his people to understand I want you to understand what's going to happen to my people and my city. I want you to understand what's going to happen to the Jew and to Jerusalem, right? Jesus holds Israel responsible to know the day of his visitation. Jesus holds Jerusalem. He holds Israel, the Jew, responsible to know the prophecies of Daniel. Do you think it's any different today? Do you think that Jesus is going to hold the church responsible to know the day of his visitation? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are five wise and five foolish. Five were taken and five were left. Two will be working in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two are grinding at the mill. One is taken, one is left. Two are in the bed. One is taken, one is left. Two are watching TV. They're both left. True? Listen, listen, God, God is holding us as equally as responsible to know the time in which we live. It's 8.06 already? You gotta, you gotta get rid of that clock. <laughs> equally, equally holds us responsible to know the day of his visitation the second time. But look at here, look at Luke chapter 19. We'll end here. Chapter 19, beginning in verse 28. Do you have a heading in your Bible? What did you say? Was it? No. No, no we, we call it that, you know, historically the church does, but, but really it's his national rejection. His triumphal entry is the next time. <laughs> okay, verse 28. When he had said this, he went on going ahead into Jerusalem, and it came to the pass uh, where he came to near Bethpage. What is that? Bethpage? What does that mean? unripened figs. And Bethany, what's Bethany mean? House of poverty, no fruit, fruitlessness, and they were spiritually impoverished. Would, would you sum that up being the state of the church in the United States today? Fruitless and spiritually impoverished? There's no doubt about that. Hmm. Interesting. Bethphage, Bethany, at the mount called Avalet, and he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you. When you enter, you'll find a cold tide, on which no one has ever 
sat, loose him and bring him here. And if anyone asks, why are you loosening him? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of him. Isn't it wonderful when the Lord uses us? Hmm? Young jackasses, old jackasses, female jackasses. <laughs> the Lord has need of him. So those who were sent departed and found it just as he has said to them. And as they were loosening the colt, the owner said to them, why are you loosening the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. And then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own garments on the colt and they sat Jesus on him. And as he went, they spread their clothes on the road. And then as he was drawing near the descent to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all of the mighty works that they had seen, saying, more fish and chips. Listen, this is all emotionalism. This is not true saving faith. They were not followers of Jesus. They were <laughs> fans. There's a difference between being a fan of Jesus and being a follower. One, it's all emotionally driven. The other one, it's a volitional surrender of who you are. It's a choice to follow him. Hmm? Spreading their clothes on the road, and as he was now drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all of the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. Now, this is the same crowd that in less than a week, what are they going to say? Crucify. Crucify him. Give us Barabbas. Barabbas. Who does Barabbas represent? The devil. Antichrist. Who's the world going to cry out for? They're going to reject Jesus more and more. Please, please, please understand that it's been foretold. And so it's okay. You don't need to get anxious about it. You don't need to be fearful. Just stay strong. Stay strong and stay faithful. And some of the Pharisees called from the crowd saying, teacher, rebuke your disciples. They didn't like that at all, did they? No, they wouldn't want to share their power and their influence. They were political animals. It was a religious, Pharisees, the Sadducees, most of them, it was just a religious front or a facade, but they were political animals, right? And so much of the church in the West is just a front, a facade, but they're, they're political animals more than they are religious. It's just a, a facade. Hmm. And he answered and he said to them, I tell you that if these should be keep silent, these very stones would immediately cry out. Don't you wish they did? It'd be the first rock concert, right? And now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept. Was it Sunday? Was it Sunday that I mentioned when he came into Jerusalem, uh, Mark, uh, Matthew 21, he was going to go into another confrontation with the Pharisees. He saw the fig tree. It had leaves on it, but he cursed it because there was no fruit representing the nation. The nation was not bearing any fruit for God. No true fruit. They, oh, they were very religious people. There was just no spiritual fruit. And then, and then later on, when his disciples walked by that same tree, the next day it was rotten. It was dead from the roots down. I mean, he could kick it over. But then in Matthew 24, he gives a parable of the fig tree. And you know that parable, that when the leaves of the tree turn green, you know that summer is near. Now, they should have known all of this, you see. As he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. He cursed the city. And he's weeping because of the discipline he has to bring about. You know, when you discipline your children, have you ever said this hurts me more than it does you? And my son would say, yeah, sure, but different places. <laughs> no. But it is true. And, and Jesus knows the discipline that's coming upon the nation, not to completely destroy them, but there is a discipline, a partial judgment. And then in verse 42, now in particular to what we're talking about tonight, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. Jesus is the Passover. The lamb who would take away the sins of the world. He would bring peace with God, peace of God, peace in God. 
Now, I hope you know what I'm talking about, and I hope you've experienced that peace in all of its fullness. Yeah, we all want peace with God, right? We all want fire insurance, but it's more than that. You don't only have peace with God, you want to have the peace of God come upon your life, where, where he rearranges your priorities, where Christmas really becomes Christmas, not the commercialism of the day, not all that worldly temptation and draw, but the real Christ of Christmas reigns in your heart every day. And so you have peace with God, you have peace of God. And then, and then you go that final step where you really completely surrender to where your life now is hid in Christ. I was visiting with someone the other day and, and uh, someone I've known for a while, haven't seen in some time, and he was speaking to his children, a couple of them are teenagers, he said this, and, and, I, and I, I, as someone I helped out and we, when he was in a very dark time in his life, and he surrendered to the Lord, and his life changed his Lord dramatic, dramatically. But he was saying to his children, this man eats, sleeps, and breathes Jesus. I warn you, that's all you're going to hear is Jesus. And he's always going to question you about the Bible. Gonna... <laughs> and I said, no, no, I'm simply the, 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 the donkey that God uses on occasion. But isn't it, isn't it, shouldn't it be true of our lives that if we have peace with God, of God, then there should be that final step where we have peace in God, where, where our life simply reflects Jesus and Jesus only. Then you will have true peace. You'll have lasting joy. A joy and a love that can't be explained. But boy, it's sure love experiencing it, don't we? Yeah, Amen. Oh, if you had only known this, thy day, the things that make for your peace. Listen, Daniel told him this was the day. 173,880 days since the command was given, 444 BC, March 14th, boom, 33 AD, Jesus arrives on the scene. If nothing else, they should have expected something marvelous and wonderful from God that very day. Now, there were a handful. Who were some of the folks that recognized that day that's recorded for us in the New Testament? Hmm? Who? Who? Simeon. My eyes have now seen, Lord. Right? Who else? Anna, the prophetess. You see, it was, listen, it was just, listen, it was a remnant a handful of people who recognized this thy day. Most of the professing church think you're out of your mind. You got three eyes. When you start talking to him about the second coming, about Jesus Christ, and you're going to jump off the earth, they think you're out of your mind. They have no idea that the day is approaching. Do you understand? We are living in the the time singular of the signs, plural. Never, ever before, and I could sit here tonight, and I, we could spend the rest of the evening until midnight talking about the multitude of signs, indicators that scream to us that the Lord is coming. Most are asleep. Most have no idea of what makes for your peace. What makes for your peace? You have the money to buy the right gifts for those you love, or more importantly, they have the money to buy the gifts that you want. That you have that Hallmark Christmas, you know, perfect people, perfect trees, perfect gift, perfect clothes, perfect house, perfect life. Wow, you're set up for a real disappointment there, aren't you? Hmm? Yeah. You hear what I'm saying, right? Our wonderful privilege now, and this is, we're going to go a lot deeper into Daniel chapter 9. You're going to really enjoy where we're going with this because it all comes together. All the puzzle pieces, wow. And when you see the global communism forming and shaping, you'll have a smile on your face. Why? You look to the eastern sky, your redemption draweth nigh. You won't be depressed. You won't be angst. You won't be in fear. Father told us ahead of time. Praise Jesus. But right now, right now, we have a responsibility. What do we need to do? Share the truth of Christmas. Share the truth of Christmas. Christmas has, listen, it has nothing to do with the trees and the presents and the festivities and the feasts. And the, if all of that is taken away from you, you still have Christmas. 
As a matter of fact, I'd like to suggest if it's taken away from you, you'll have a far more glorious Christmas. Because Christmas is about one person and the celebration of that one person. Amen? Let the Christ of Christmas monopolize your, your Christmas, your holiday, your life, and go share that with everybody. Now listen, when you get together at those family gatherings, do not be afraid to bring up the name. What name? Jesus. Jesus. Don't say God. Jesus. Don't be afraid. Do it lovingly. Do it with compassion. And do it with passion, Petros, right? But, but don't be afraid. Bring it up in the conversation. Burning Christmas trees is burning a Christian symbol. Is that not true? Yes, of course it is. Of course it is. Don't be intimidated by the world. And you're not, you know, listen, you're not trying to step on anybody's toes and you're not trying to offend anybody. What are you trying to do? You're trying to touch their heart and awaken them, open their eyes. He'd be far more effective if he'd use angels, but he's chosen to use us. What do you say? We'll go for it? Yeah. Terry, you got a closing song? Shall we stand it?